Good morning, church. If I could have you grab your seat. Uh, we are excited to be with you this morning and to be able to worship together. Thank you for coming out and braving the cold of the sub-zero weather. Uh, the 8 o'clock service, I think it was negative 8 on my watch. And so for you guys, it's only negative 2. So <laughs> you, are, um, you are blessed by 6 more degrees. Um, well, as we start this morning, I just wanted to make mention of a few things in your bulletin. Number one, just want to ask you for your prayers for us this coming weekend. Our youth are doing our winter camp. We have a, a, an unusually large number of people going on it, large amount of students, and so we need a lot of prayer. An unusually large amount of prayer that everything would go smooth and that our students would grow in the Lord. Um, and so we know that that is a work of the Spirit. So please pray for us in that. Just wanted to also make mention about the Koinonia. It is normally, I, I do believe, the third Friday of the month, but it is moved back to the 26th. So please make note of that if you're going to come to the, the Koinonia Fellowship. It's on February 26th. Well, as we begin our time of worship this morning, I just wanted to encourage you with giving priority to worship. The psalmist writes in Psalm 132 of David's commitment to build a place of worship for the Lord. And of course, you know that as in his zeal to build a house for the Lord, the Lord said, oh, no, no, I will build you a house and I will establish your throne forever, and I will raise one up who will sit on it, and we on that throne forever. And we know that that descendant of David is Jesus Christ, Son of God in flesh. And, his, and so we come and we worship him this morning, our provision, God's provision for our sin, in whom the enemy of sin and death was defeated through his work on the cross, his death and resurrection. As we begin, I just want to read Psalm 132 this morning before we turn our attention to baptism. Remember, O Lord, in David's favor, all the hardships he endured, how um, he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob, I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard of it in Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Jaar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness and let your saints shout for joy. For the sake of your servant David, do not turn away the face of your anointed one. The Lord swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne. If your sons keep my commandment and my testimonies that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. Her priests I will clothe with salvation and her saints will shout for joy. There I will make a horn to sprout for David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. This is speaking none other than our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our worship this morning. Father, as we come before you and we think of this psalm of old and how David was zealous for your worship, and, and then we also see how you were zealous to establish a covenant with him and to raise up uh, a descendant from him to sit on the throne forever. We know that that is your son whom you gave for the forgiveness of our sins. May we magnify him this morning. May we um, glorify you and all that we do. We ask for your help through the power of the Spirit this morning. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. If you would, uh, turn your attention to the screens as we um, follow the Lord's command in baptism. Do you feel the world? Um, I'm 12 
years old. I'm in sixth grade. I go to American Academy, and one of my favorite things to do is to paint. Last year, I realized I was a sinner and needed a savior. Um, I believed that Jesus died and rose again for my sins and that I needed him. Uh, baptism is a public demonstration showing that you know Christ. So baptism is a picture of Jesus' death and resurrection and us being born again in Christ, um, living a new life. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah. Iris, upon the profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in obedience to his divine command, I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. today. I'm nine years old and I am in fourth grade. One of my favorite things is VBS and I've been at Parker Bible Church for eight years. About a year ago I came to my mom and I said I believe in Jesus that he died on the cross for our sins and rose again. And I came to salvation and I believed in God. Baptism is a picture of Christ being buried and being resurrected and me being buried with Christ and living a new life. Upon the profession of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and in obedience to his divine command, I also baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Once again today, we've done as the Lord commands, and still. There's room. Pastor Michael. Well, that is a great way to start uh, service on a Sunday morning, don't you think? Amen. We are grateful to see these things and, and encouraged when we see these young ones come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and, and profess that in front of the church. And so... Uh, we rejoice with them. We rejoice with that family. And um, indeed, as Pastor said, there is room for more. So uh, we look forward to seeing many more come to know Christ as Lord and Savior and, and uh, profess that. Well, today we have come to lift our voices in praise and worship to the Lord our God, to be able to hear the truth of God's word as it is spoken 
And so we rejoice together and we are going to stand together this morning and lift our voices singing a great hymn, all, all Creatures of Our God and King. What a joy. Let's lift our voices and let's give him praise this morning. Let's sing together. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing. guys know that I think you are awesome, and I really do, but I even think that in a greater way today, I mean, for this many people to, to come out when it's like really cold out there, I know in my truck this morning early, it was like minus 19, and I think it's really warmed up now, but it's still below zero, and for you, for you guys to come here on a day like this to hear me talk about giving, uh, that's incredible. I just saw two people leave. Anyway, uh, <laughs> no, but uh, we're glad that you are here this morning, and uh, we're glad we're all inside, right, and nice and warm. Uh, but uh, we are, this morning, going to uh, focus our hearts on what God has to say about giving. Uh, I, before that, I, though, I want to mention one thing. It, as amazing as you are, we're not going to ask you to come back out tonight, okay, uh, with the temperatures what they are. Uh, we're going to say, everybody, stay home and stay warm tonight. So no evening service tonight. But 
Having said that, we are going to focus our hearts in worship this morning. And so take your Bible and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 this morning. We'll be looking at those first eight verses again. We just can't seem to get through this. Weeks of introduction and uh, then weeks to go through it, but that's okay. Uh, we're going we're gonna to know it well when we get to the end of it. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8, after you have found that in your Bible, stand with me, let's read it together. Beginning verse 1 again. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So we urged Titus that as he had previously made a beginning so he would also complete in you this gracious work as well. But just as you abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all earnestness and in the love we inspired in you, see that you abound in this gracious work also. I'm not speaking this as a command but as proving through the earnestness of others the sincerity of your love also. Let's pray together. Father, we are so grateful to you for the gift of salvation that we have in Christ. We thank you for, for these that have shared their testimonies through baptism this morning, that they have repented of sin and put their faith and trust in Christ alone to save them. And Lord, we pray that if there are others here today that have yet to do that, that they also would trust in you and receive your free gift of eternal life. And Lord, we thank you for your word that you've given us instruction that we know how to live in this world and how to live in this world that is temporary to invest in that which is forever. And so, Lord, help us to be wise in that. And, Lord, we want to follow your principles. We want to be good stewards. We want to uh, be investing uh, these things that we have, that you have placed in our hands. We know that have come from your hand just for a little while. But help us to be wise stewards of these things. And, Lord, that uh, we can be about eternity. And Lord, we, uh, again, we ask you would help us as we worship, that our hearts would be fully set on you. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Be seated.
I hope you caught that, that we can be still and know that he is God. In the midst of the flood, in the midst of everything that it goes on, we can know that. That reminds me of Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, where it says that he who hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it stood because it was built on a firm foundation. Oh, what a joy to know that if we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if we hear the truth of God's word, even as it will be preached today and we obey, we are obedient to that word, then it says that our house is built on a firm foundation. You know, the one thing that it doesn't say, it doesn't tell us how those two men reacted to those, th those storms. But my guess is the man who was built on the firm foundation, he was still, he was quiet. He was not concerned because he knew that he had built on the foundation. The other man that had not been obedient, my guess is he was fearful because he knew that he could feel his house shaking and he knew that this house was going to fall. All this morning, may we recognize that God is the one who holds on to us, that we can trust in him and we can rest in him. Let's stand together as we sing another great hymn, He Will Hold Me Fast, recognizing that indeed it is he who holds us, not us who hold him. Our grip will fail. His never does. He holds us fast. Let's sing to him. When my favorite will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never fearful path for my love is often cold he must hold me fast he will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so he will Satisfied, he will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life, he will hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight. When he comes at last, he. Savior loves me so.
as we come to our time of worship of tithes and offerings, I just wanted to remind us that the things that we love deeply, we do not need a command to express that love towards it. And as we look across the pages of Scripture, even before the law was given, men were offering and giving to the Lord from their heart, out of their love for Him, His provision, and His protection over them. I pray this would be your heart this morning as we come to this time of worship. Let's pray. Father, truly this is a time of worship as we reflect on all of your provisions and, our, and we are moved in our hearts towards gratitude and love towards you and expressing that. We've done that through song. And we've done that through gathering. We've we're going to do that through the, the preaching of your word. And now we, we express our love for you as we give. And Father, as we're learning principles that we give from our heart and we give generously and we give cheerfully because we love you. We're so thankful for the great provision of Christ and the atonement for our sins and then our daily provisions that you give each and every day. Father, as we give these gifts, we pray that you would bless them, that you would be glorified, that your gospel would go forward, and that people would be saved through this. We ask all this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. Even as we give this morning, let's continue to lift our voices together in praise. Vast, unmeasured, boundless, free, rolling as a mighty ocean in its fullness over me. Underneath me, all around me, is the current of your love, leading onward, leading forward to your glory. Rest above. Oh, the deep, deep love. All I need and trust is the deep, deep love of Jesus. Oh, the deep. Spread his praise from shore to shore. How he came to pay our ransom through the saving cross he bore. How he watches o'er his loved ones, those he died to make his own. How for them he's interceded. surpassing all the rest it's an ocean full of blessing in the midst of every test oh the deep deep love of jesus 
Jesus, mighty Savior, precious friend, you will bring us home to glory where your love will never end. Oh, the deep, deep love, all I need and trust is the Earlier on, I said that giving is a matter of faith, and it truly is. Our willingness to give is based on our trust in the promises of God. And one of the key promises in Scripture is Philippians 4.19, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. If we truly believe this, it will greatly impact our giving. At the end of World War II, the Allied nations began the process of rebuilding Europe. And one of the first issues they faced was to provide for hundreds of orphaned children. So they built some camps to house them, and they rounded them all up, put them in the camps, and they fed them and took care of all their needs. But even though these orphans were fed daily with the finest food, they had another problem because the children would not go to sleep at night. At night, they were extremely restless, and they would even go for days without sleeping at night. And it was interesting because they fed them three meals a day and provided for all their needs. They had comfortable beds to sleep in, but the kids would not sleep. And those in charge could not understand what was wrong until they finally asked enough questions. And eventually they came to understand what the problem was and they came up with a solution. At bedtime, they would come along and they would hand out a small loaf of bread for each child to hold through the night. And soon, all the children were sleeping through the night. What was the problem? Well, the problem was that even though they were full that day, they had a fear about whether or not they would have food for the next day, it was fear and anxiety over the next day's provisions that kept them from sleeping at night. But by knowing they had a loaf of bread in their hands, they were able to go to sleep. Now that, of course, is an extreme illustration connected with a specific circumstance, but it serves to illustrate 
how anxiety can keep us from trusting God in the area of giving. And the truth of the matter is that as children of God, we have his promise to supply all our needs. We have his promise that there is nothing to fear for tomorrow. He has promised to meet our needs, and whether or not we truly believe that has an enormous impact on our giving. As we consider our giving, even if we don't think we have enough to give, we should have confidence that if God were to ask us to specifically sacrifice for his kingdom, that he would replace what we give and even provide more. That's the faith aspect of living according to God's economy. And Philippians 4.19 becomes that little loaf of bread we can hang on to at night. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that we shouldn't plan and save and invest wisely and work hard and all of that. But what this means is that in the midst of all that, we know we can fully trust God to meet our needs. And as we give, we know we can even give in a state of poverty and trust him to take care of us. And here in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, we're introduced to some believers who understood the promises of God and they knew they could absolutely trust him for their future. And so beginning in chapter 8, verse 1, Paul uses the Macedonians as an illustration of new covenant giving. And in these first eight verses, he talks about what a devoted follower of Christ does in regard to giving. This is how committed, dedicated, selfless Christians give. The Macedonians provide a model for new covenant giving. And we need to emulate that model. And as we have started through this, we need to take this in nine parts. We briefly touched on the first two last time, but I want to take a little deeper dive this morning and review those, and then we'll move on. We began with the principle of giving. Look at verse one again. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. Notice that Paul addresses this sensitive subject of giving ever so gently. He begins by affectionately calling them brothers and sisters in essence, but he doesn't even mention giving until later in the passage. He just says, I want you to be aware of an amazing example of God's grace. By the way, I think I should throw this in right here. He's going to urge the Corinthians to give. And he's going to implore them to become a part of this special offering for the saints in Jerusalem. But he's not going to come at this from the perspective of hammering them with guilt or utilizing some form of manipulation. No, he's going to point to the motivation of God's grace, and he's going to put before them the example of some who are fully trusting God's plan of economy. And I think we really find the key word to this entire section right here in verse 1, and that is the word grace. When Paul says, we wish to make known to you, that's his way of saying, pay attention here. This is something really important. And then he goes on to point to the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia. Of course, the word Grace is the word charis. It can have a 
wide variety of meanings. It can mean attractiveness, charm, winsomeness, favor, and many, many others. But here it likely means generosity. In light of this, the concept of grace giving became the cornerstone then for the early Christians as they talked about how they were to accomplish the work of God in their day. In fact, the term grace became the primary concept really for understanding every aspect of the Christian life. Paul uses this term a hundred times of the 156 times that it appears in the New Testament. Paul likes this word grace. He uses some form of this word eight times in these two chapters, and it's used four times in just these first eight verses. In fact, it's important for us to understand that he really uses it in two different ways in verse one. Notice he calls this the grace of God, meaning that God is the source of this ability. The, Ma the Macedonians were able to give as they did because God enabled them to do so. But secondly, this grace is that which has been given, poured out, if you will, in the churches of Macedonia. This is grace that is at work in the believers in Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea. They are truly grace givers, and that tells us that we can be as well. The same grace of God that was evident in their lives can be evident in ours as well. Kent Hughes writes, Paul's teaching on giving, giving is really a sermon on grace from beginning to end. This is all about grace. It's referred to here as the grace of giving, and that is exactly what motivates and enables believers of all ages to impact their world for Christ. The grace really begins with Christ's reconciling sinners unto himself and then flows through the heart of genuine believers and it is poured out then through the grace of giving. As I said, Paul doesn't really even mention giving in verse 1. He just kind of alludes to it and he doesn't even say anything about giving until he gets to verse 3 where he says they gave of their own accord. But he, he doesn't start with giving. He starts with grace. And that's what drives new covenant giving. This is very, very crucial for us to understand. The primary motive for a giving is not human kindness. It's not philanthropy. It's not just some sort of giving to relieve someone's conscience. No, it is the grace of God at work in a believer's life. In fact, this kind of giving is not really normal giving, what we would call normal giving. It's really supernatural giving. It's not the kind of giving that you see in the world today. You know, it's not the kind of giving that is done by some billionaire giving a token amount from his vast wealth to get his name on a building. It's not that kind of giving. No, this kind of giving is prompted by something far greater than human philanthropy. It is prompted by the work of the grace of God in the heart of a transformed person. MacArthur says, sensitivity to new life Longing for godly things, loving heaven more than earth, desiring to fulfill kingdom purposes. That's what's behind this giving. Saving grace and sanctifying grace. It's this spiritual transformation that causes genuine believers to 
seek first the kingdom of God and then trust him to add to our lives all that we need. It's this transformation that leads us to set our affections on things above instead of the things of this world. And these are the results of the work of grace in our lives. And it leads us to have a longing to give generously and to give sacrificially. All this is a part of what the grace of God does in our lives. Well, the Macedonians exemplified this kind of grace giving. They didn't give tokens from among their riches because they didn't have any riches. They didn't give like selfish Christians whose love for the eternal is matched by their love for the world's. They didn't give like those who struggle with letting go of the world's. No, they gave like those who understood this world is not our ultimate home. MacArthur says they gave like totally devout, dedicated, committed, sold out Christians give. And that is they gave magnanimously and generously in response to the work of the grace of God in their hearts. Folks, the bottom line is generous giving is one effect of saving and sanctifying grace in the life of a believer. The Macedonians were a model of this and we should emulate them. We don't give like the world gives. Our giving is according to the grace of God. And as I said last time, I really strongly believe this. Anyone who has experienced the grace of God in salvation, when they know they don't deserve that, will become a grace giver. You can't experience that without naturally wanting to extend that kind of grace toward others in giving. It just flows naturally from a transformed heart. Well, we'd better move on here. We also saw a second point in our outline last week, which is the poverty of giving. Look again at verse 2. That in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. And then verse 3 says, For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. Now verse 2 has an interesting structure to it. It begins with a negative, moves to a positive, and then goes back to a negative. First of all, they are in a great deal of affliction. Not only are they poor, they're also picked on. They're being persecuted. The literal idea of the words being used here is that they're being crushed. They're being crushed. Hughes says, the surrounding culture kept squeezing them harder and harder because of the Macedonians' devotion to Christ. And what Paul does here, he's, he, he really just piles up word after word to describe their suffering. The word for ordeal means test. And the test they were going through was great, he says. That's a word that means severe. It's a word that can mean mega, big, large, grand, massive. The word for test is a word that was often used to speak of putting metal in a furnace to test it. This was severe testing. We don't know exactly what this was, but we know it was extensive. We do know of some of the suffering of the Macedonians. We know, for example, that the Thessalon Thessalonians had been attacked viciously by the Jews. We see that in Acts chapter 17. We read in 1 Thessalonians 2, 14 and 15 that the Thessalonian believers endured the same kind of suffering at the hand of the Jews that Jesus did. And 
as the prophets did who were driven out. And Paul said of them in 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, you received the word with much tribulation. In Philippians 1, 29, we also see this was the case with the Philippians as well. But it's possible there is some kind of greater persecution going on at this time that we don't know the specifics about. Either way, we know the Macedonians were being afflicted greatly at this time. The word for afflicted is a word that is used for the crushing of grapes. It had to do with some sort of great pressure. It could be pressure to conform, like some kind of political pressure that you and I may soon find ourselves under. It could, it could refer to mental pressure. It could refer to spiritual pressure or even physical pressure. But you say, wait a minute, but what's the application here? Well, the application is that bad circumstances have no negative impact on the giving of dedicated believers. These Macedonians gave in spite of that. They didn't have a poor me mentality. They didn't say, why are you asking us to give? We have enough problems of our own. They didn't say, you know, these are uncertain times. And we don't know what our economic future will look like. And we don't know if we're going to have enough for tomorrow. They didn't say that. No, in the midst of prolonged, intense suffering and deprivation, they still gave. And listen, that's what genuine believers do. Devout believers live above their circumstances. The Macedonians were put under a severe test, but they passed it with flying colors. They got an A+. Their massive Hardship had no effect whatsoever on their giving. Now, why is that? Well, Paul explains that in the second part of verse 2. He says, their abundance of joy overflowed. This means not only were they willing to do it, but they were happy to do it. In fact, they were abundantly happy to do it. They exhibited what we're going to see when we get to chapter 9 and verse 7. Let each one do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That was, they were cheerful givers. They had abundant joy in spite of their circumstances. And that joy overflowed in the expression of their giving. The abundance or surplus of their joy speaks of something that was beyond what we would normally expect. Listen, they didn't give because someone pressured them to give. They didn't give because there was some sort of high pressure fundraiser manipulating them. They didn't give because they felt like they needed to give or because they were afraid God might punish them if they didn't. No, they gave from the joy that was in their hearts. That joy is the unceasing joy of the Lord that can never be negated by circumstances. Their joy rose above their pain. It was untouched by their suffering. And their joy was because they knew they could lay up treasures in heaven that they could never lose. And their joy was in seeking to advance the kingdom of God through the small amount of money they had. And they just felt privileged to be able to be a part of the Lord's work. And folks, listen, that's the attitude God wants from us. But then Paul goes back to the negative side in verse 2 when he says, and their deep poverty. We've already touched on this, but the Macedonians were very poor. 
The word for deep means extremely deep. It's like rock bottom. You can't get any deeper than this. You could say they were in the pits of poverty. Interestingly, the Greek word that is used here is a word from which we get our English word bathysphere, which is a vessel for exploring the deepest part of the ocean. This is not the usual word for poverty. The normal word, pentecost, means you have very little. This word means you have nothing. You have nothing. And listen, for those of us here in America in 2021, it, this is really, I think, impossible for us to relate how deeply poor they were. It's a major stretch for us to even comprehend the depth of their poverty. And by the way, it's significant that there are only two other places in the New Testament where this Greek word is used. One is in the next section in 2 Corinthians 8, where we see in verse 9 that Christ became extremely poor so that we could become extremely rich. And the other one is in Revelation 2.9, where it says of those in the church at Smyrna, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. These believers in Smyrna were just as poor as those in Macedonia, but our Lord says, you're really rich. You have the riches that count the most. Now, why is Paul emphasizing the Macedonians' extreme poverty to the Corinthians? Well, I think it's so that they can't say something like, well, of course you're giving. After all, your economy is booming and you have a great abundance of wealth. They knew they couldn't say that because they knew the Macedonians didn't have any wealth. They knew that if these Macedonians could give in the midst of their extreme poverty, that they, the Corinthians, had no excuse. The end of verse 2 simply says, this overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. Hughes writes, in a parched existence, squalid little churches gushed forth with the joy of giving. They practiced the grace of giving. In fact, there's really no other way to explain this. It was a supernatural work of God in their hearts. And they were able to do over and above what anybody could ever imagine. They lived by faith and not by sight. They held in their hand the promise of God and that was enough to trust him for the future. This is what genuine believers do. They don't wait till they have more. They give from their poverty just as the Macedonians did and as the widow did her two mites. The issue is not how much you have. It's what you do with what you have. And it's a heart of faith that dares to trust God. And it's a heart of generosity that is created by the grace of God. Well, we better move on. Notice, thirdly, the proportion of giving. Look at verse 3. Verse 3. For I testify that according to their ability. Stop right there for a moment. When Paul says, for I testify, he was indicating firsthand knowledge. This is not something he had heard through the grapevine. He knew these churches at Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. In fact, he was responsible for establishing those churches. And he knew firsthand how they had responded to this need. And when he says they gave according to their ability, he uses the common Greek word dunamis, they gave according to their power to give. And we have further insight into this principle uh, down in verse 12 of the same chapter. 
Verse 12 says, for if the readiness is present, in other words, if there's a readiness to give, it is acceptable according to what a man has, not according to what he does not have. Here's the principle. God does not expect you to give what you don't have. What does he expect? He expects you to give according to what you do have. That's all he asks. Give according to what you have. And by the way, what does this imply? Well, it implies, first of all, that there's no fixed amount that all of us are supposed to give. And you know, some people want to set the tenth or the tithe as the amount, but that's not new covenant giving. In the New Testament, we're told that we're to give according to our ability to give. Do you remember what Paul said to the Corinthians in the first letter, back in 1 Corinthians 16? In verse 2, he said, On the first day of every week, let each one of you put aside and save as he may prosper, that no collections will be made when I come. Paul told them, Give as the Lord prospers you. If God allows you to have more, then give more. But you're to give according to what you have. Listen, God does not want you to charge your offering on your credit card and go further in debt. That, that is not what God wants you to do. God expects you to give from what you have. And our giving is to be proportional to the way God blesses us. Then he takes this a step further. Fourthly, we see the price of giving. Look at verse three again. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave. Now, don't misunderstand what he's saying here. He's not saying Give what you don't have. No, he's saying give from what you have, but give in a measure that is sacrificial. You see, you can give from what you have in a way that is not sacrificial, or you can give from what you have in a way that is sacrificial. And what Paul is saying here is that sacrificial giving is what should characterize us as recipients of God's grace. You may remember in the Old Testament, King David said, I will not give the Lord that which cost me nothing. In the same way, the Macedonians were not about to give in a way that was not sacrificial to them. The Macedonians gave beyond what you would expect people in extreme poverty to give. That's because they gave sacrificially. They gave over and above what you would think would be their ability to give. And then fifthly, we find the passion of giving, the passion of giving. Go back to verse three one more time. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave what? of their own accord. That means they gave of their own volition. It was their own decision to give. Literally, the Greek word means one who chooses his own course of action. Their giving was self-motivated, was by their own choice. It was according to their own initiative. Now, there's a ton of application that we could pull from this. For example, this tells us that our appeals in the church need to be based on free will giving. We must guard against pressuring people to give or manipulating people through some sort of guilt or false promise like the health and wealth prosperity preachers. No, we should let the need be known and then allow people to give according to the desires of their own hearts. We should let people decide what they're going to give. 
Now, don't misunderstand that. That doesn't mean we don't explain what the Bible has to say about giving as we're doing here. It doesn't mean we don't rightfully challenge people to be more faithful in giving or to invest more diligently in the things of eternity. No, it just means we need to be careful how we make financial appeals in the church. That we don't fall into the trap of lifting the offering through some sort of manipulative method. No, Christians are to give of their own accord. Now, another application here is that we need to be cheerful givers. In other words, we ought to want to give, and therefore, when we give of our own accord, it is giving according to what is in our hearts to give. And again, this points back to our devotion to Christ. If we truly love him and we want to further his work and we want to make sure his gospel goes around the world, then we're going to be like the, like the uh, Macedonians and we're going to even be begging for the opportunity to be a part of the offering. But I think there's something else here and we'll probably need to stop with this one today. But you know, it's very possible that Paul never even asked the Macedonians to participate in this offering. If you go to chapter 9 and you look at verse 2, Paul says, I know your readiness. That is the Corinthians' readiness in the matter of giving. I know you're ready to give. Of which I boast about you to the Macedonians, namely that Achaia has been prepared since last year and your zeal has stirred up most of them. That's interesting, isn't it? What was the original motivation for the Macedonians to get involved in this offering? Apparently from this verse, it was the zeal of the Corinthians to give toward it. It was those who were in the province of Achaia down there in Corinth who originally inspired the Macedonians. And remember, as Paul is writing 2 Corinthians, it's been a year since he first talked to the Corinthians about this offering. A year ago, they started giving toward this, and apparently their giving inspired the Macedonians to also want to get involved. It's very possible that Paul never asked the Macedonians to be a part of this, perhaps because he thought they were too poor. But when they heard that the Corinthians were doing this, they decided they wanted to give to it as well. And that certainly fits with what we see in chapter 8, verse 4, where Paul says they were begging us with much entreaty for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. What this may imply is that Paul had been hesitant even to ask the Macedonians to participate because of their poverty, but they begged him for the favor of participation as soon as they heard about it. But again, this is a reflection of their gracious hearts. They volunteered. They even begged to be included in this. They had experienced the grace of God in salvation. And they were experiencing the grace of God every day in sanctification. So they exhibited a deep desire to give for this important purpose in the church, even in the midst of their poverty. Well, as I said, we'll have to stop here for today. I promise we'll get through the rest of it next week. How do we measure up in comparison? Where do we stand? Are we like the Macedonians? Are we pleasing to the Lord in this critical area of discipleship. Let's pray together. Father, we pray this morning you would help us to respond to you and your word as you would have us to. Lord, we want to be pleasing in your sight. So Lord, help us to 
comply and help us to see the wisdom and your plan and to just have a heart that desires to be part of all you're doing. And Lord, we pray if there are those here today that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we pray that they would come to know him today. That they would repent of sin and put their faith and trust in Christ alone for salvation. They would receive your free gift of eternal life. But Lord, whatever it is we need to do this morning and deal with and respond to, help us to do exactly as you would have us to. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to have some elders here near the front at the end of the service. Uh, they're here to help you if you need to receive Christ. If you need to follow in baptism, you need to be a part of this church family. If you uh, need a word of counsel or prayer, maybe uh, you want to recommit your stewardship to the Lord and uh, ask the Lord to help you to be more faithful in that area. You can do that this morning. But these men will be here to help you with that. Well, I mentioned no evening service tonight, but we have a lot of things to get involved with throughout the week. Hopefully, this thing will go over and uh, we'll get out of the deep freeze and uh, warm back up just a little bit at least. So looking forward to that. Let's stand together. Pastor Michael's coming to lead us as we sing. <clears throat> Well, if you would sing with me as we close this morning. Change my heart, O oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O oh God, may I be like you. You are the great afternoon. If you can, because we are not meeting tonight, we, we need to take the chairs down and set up for ladies Bible study for Tuesday morning. If you could help to do that, that would be uh, a blessing and uh, many hands make short work. So uh, if you can uh, stay and help with that, that would be a blessing to everyone. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon. You are dismissed. <laughs>